So welcome everybody to our second Preparing Future Faculty event for the fall 2015 semester. Um, I appreciate your coming out on a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. to, to join our wonderful panelists for a, a really good conversation on the new faculty experience and really getting uh, a deeper understanding and perspective from those that are actually experiencing these and are really in the trenches dealing with these issues of uh, new faculty experience. Uh, my name is Wee Yusuf. I am the chair for the Preparing Future Faculty Steering Committee. So if you have any questions about the PFF program or the PFF certificate, you can come talk to me after the event or you can send me an email or call my office. And if you need more information about the Preparing Future Faculty program, we have brochures, um, and the certificate application form um, in, in the back. I also wanted to make a very quick uh, announcement about Grad 700 Professional Development. It's an online one credit hour um, course that's offered in the summer, in the spring and in the summer. So if you're interested in additional professional development, um, particularly for those planning on going into academia, Grad 700 might be a course that you'll think about think about taking. Uh, more information about Grad 700, there's a, short, a small flyer also on the table in the back, um, and I will also be sending via the PFF Lister more information about Grad 700. The other thing about Grad 700 is that it also counts as two non-PFF events toward meeting the PFF certificate requirements. So if you're two PFF events short, or non-PFF events um, short for the certificate, you can do it in one, in one swoop. So again, think about Grad 700, and if you have more questions, I'll be more than happy to, to talk to you about it, about it uh, some more. Um, but let's get started with our Preparing Future Faculty event. We have four great panelists across four different <coughs> colleges here at, here at ODU, and I will let them very briefly uh, introduce themselves. We'll start with Vanessa, and then um, I will kind of start our questions, and the panelists can respond to that. And we'll conclude with the panelists' tips for how to succeed in making that transition, um, and then we'll open it up for question and answer for a question, question and answer session. So. Vanessa, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, well, I'm Vanessa Panfell. I'm a tenure track assistant professor in the Depar Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice in the College of Arts and Letters. Um, it's Even though it's my first year here, I did a two-year postdoc prior to coming here, but this first year feels very much like a first year still, uh, despite that experience. Uh, I'm Chris Glass. I'm an assistant professor in tenure track uh, in my third year uh, in the College of Education in the higher education program. Um, and uh, I study international students' academic work and publicly engaged scholarship. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Rajesh Paleti. I'm a faculty in uh, civil engineering department. I work mainly in transportation engineering. Uh, I started here last fall, so this is my second year here. Um, I worked briefly for about uh, one and a half year for a private consultancy before moving back to academia. So, yeah, that's pretty much about me. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Caparna. I'm a lecturer, so a non-tenure track position um, in the College of Health Sciences. And then I also direct ODU Monarch Physical Therapy, which is a new physical therapy clinic here on campus. So if any of you have injuries, then I will be happy to help you with that as well. Um, but I'll share a little bit of my background. I actually started here at ODU um, and obtained a bachelor's and master's degree in education and went right into a teaching position after my master's degree. So that's one experience I'll share with you as a new teacher. Then at a crossroads in my career where I had to decide if I was going to go PhD tract or DPT, I actually looked at more of a clinical um, line, and it was a master's degree at that time, so I went back and got a master's in physical therapy before the profession transitioned to doctorate. And now I'm back after being in the clinical world for a long time as um, transitioning from adjunct teaching here to a full-time position that's split between clinical and teaching responsibilities. So hopefully some of those experiences will be helpful for you as well. All right, well, to start with, our first question for our panelists is, how would you describe the transition from graduate student to faculty member? And who wants to field this first? Um, I'll start. So the first part, um, as when I had finished my master's degree, I was actually uh, given the opportunity to be able to teach in a program that I had just completed. So I think one of the biggest challenges was in the transition being um, in a position of teaching people who I was just a colleague with. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually a peer with several of the people who were in the cohort behind me. So the transition was very exciting in a lot of ways that some of the classes that I had just taken, I was gonna be able to 
add things from a recent student perspective and share um, knowledge that way because I had just taken the classes. So take some of those positive things and then say, oh, okay, and I'd love to do this with that class. So that was a really exciting thing for me, I think, to be able to take something that I had experienced as a student and then transition it into something I was sharing from a professional perspective. Um, something that I <clears throat> remember thinking about was the transition from unstructured time to structured time. So uh, when you're a doctoral student or um, a graduate student um, uh, working on a terminal degree, um, you might be teaching courses, you might have service that you're involved in, um, but on the whole, you have more unstructured time at that point than you probably ever will moving forward. Um, and, in, and for some people that might be good and for some people that might be bad. So I work very well, you know, without having hard deadlines that, you know, I can, I can keep moving forward on projects, but um, uh, some people, you know, they, they need a little more structure. But so I, I wouldn't say that's a good or a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of that when you become a faculty member, now you'll be definitely teaching courses. You'll be uh, on committees. You might be advising students. You might be mentoring students. Um, you ha you're expected to go to departmental events. So whereas in the past, you might have been able to say, oh, well, I don't really want to go to that one. When you're a faculty member trying to get accustomed to a new place, you're really expected to show up and be there and be present. And so um, because I like doing that stuff, it, 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 I guess, wasn't so much of a huge change. But I would say that, the, the change from unstructured time to structured time is something you should be aware of. Um, I mean, one of the things I felt was uh, as long as you're a graduate student, you're working under the umbrella of your advisor. So everything that you produce goes through a lot of screening by mm -hmm. multiple years of uh, people who are more experienced than you. But once you are uh, a professor by yourself, so you are going to have the final say on things. So it puts more uh, kind of, you should be more careful about how you handle things. So some of the things that probably didn't take much time or you didn't budget for, mm -hmm. uh, previously you right. should budget for more time on making those revisions to have the same level of quality control like you had before. So Probably three other random thoughts. Uh, one is, there's no feeling like your first day of class when you introduced yourself as Dr. So-and-so. Uh, I remember that. Uh, that was a big transition because it was a kind of a statement of identity and it actually mm -hmm. is, it carried a little bit of weight uh, for me when I did that the first time. Uh, second is, uh, the relationship I built with my advisor during the dissertation was important when I became a faculty member because that advisor can put you on national committees, professional service, can be a source of research data, mm -hmm. can be a source of advice when you don't have somebody you can turn to in your department. Mm -hmm. So the transition involves probably developing a different kind of relationship with your advisor because it's not built in anymore because there's not the dissertation. Uh, and then third is like there's all kinds of things that make our departments run that, that I did not know about as much as an informed student. Like, I mean, there's committees to be on, there's, there's policies around dissertation advisees, there's things around continuous credits. There's all these things that happen that um, you, have, you kind of develop an appreciation for um, what goes behind making a, a, a grad program or undergrad program function. So, um, and then your role in that, hopefully. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, and our second question is, what issues did you struggle with the most? I'm I think I'm still struggling, but I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this might be a therapy session for the panel. <laughs> so uh, one of the things was one, uh, typically, at least in my case, it was like I was working with a kind of a big shot who was already quite big in the field. so. We could work on several different projects on really with a lot of resources available. So when you graduate at that, from, from that kind of a background, you expect to work on huge projects. You have all these ideas in your mind that you want to suddenly transform the world, right? So, uh, but, but once you come, finding those initial resources is a big challenge. So I think uh, directly going after, at least in the engineering field, finding research funds is a very big thing so uh, going after huge 1 million projects uh, by yourself uh, the chances are fairly low so it we should start with probably some of the low hanging fruits talk to local agencies or state departments and collaborate with other folks before uh, before you want to jump in and achieve something big i'm not trying to play down uh, huge expectations or huge goals but i think it 
it's helpful to be a little realistic about your goals, what you want to achieve. You need to gradually build. Uh, I think I'm. I realize that now, but I have not started the next phase, so I'm also still learning that process. Yeah. So you're looking for funding. Um, do you have an idea that you want, and you find someone who wants to fund it, or do you look out there and see what's out there and being funded that people want to fund, and then shape that idea? You know? build towards their idea? It's always a challenge, like uh, not all ideas that I wanted to work on, there is uh, interest out there. So, mm -hmm. but uh, what I realized is uh, I, I kind of try to partition my work into two things, the things that I like the most. Uh, and I try to channel those, my energy for those into publications. So I try to work on things that interest the most for scholarly publications and and I have to do money, uh, do things for money, right? Because I need to start a research group. So although it's not my core interest, I still uh, do allocate some time for writing proposals, which are slightly different from what my core interests are. So publications is one thing which at least relatively we have under our control. So I try to use that uh, avenue for uh, channelizing my energy. I mean, I went from, I guess, one of the issues I, I had difficult time is I had never had a GA work for me, and it actually to work with a GA to be on the other side of that relationship uh, can be a little bit of a, a challenge to know how to best use a GA. Uh, not every GA is maybe as motivated as you are to become a faculty member, um, and, uh, and that can be an issue. And then there's probably just general life transitions. Um, I mean, just the amount of energy that you spend if you have uh, significant others that you're traveling with. Um, they have to transition uh, as well to wherever you're going to go, no matter, and they're going to go through their own transitions. And so that takes um, some of the um, you know, so focusing on that, I think, was, um, was important, um, but a struggle at times because um, while I was happy in my new position, uh, other people in my, my family were adjusting. Any other comments for Nassau or other thoughts? Um, I do. So as a student, sometimes you have the flexibility as you're prioritizing things, you might not have to be as actively engaged in a particular lesson or you can say, oh, I'm going to put more energy here or there. As a faculty member, you have to be on your A game every day. And so you have to be well prepared with the materials as you're going into class. So for me, it was always thinking about being several steps ahead of the students and not mm -hmm. just necessarily finishing yeah. up a project yeah. at the last second because some classes may go more quickly than what you had originally planned, and you have to have material to keep the conversation going. Um, and then also, I think for me, it was learning how to navigate the university from a faculty perspective, mm -hmm. because I was used to operating as a student and gathering information certain ways or knowing what the resources were. And the faculty were tremendous here um, to help me navigate and learn almost how to speak another language or how to have different roles. Um, so I'd say you do have a different role, and it's very different from a being a student and then being in the front of the classroom. So the preparation is different for both, I would say, too. Yeah, especially if you're teaching more classes than you've ever taught mm -hmm. before. So um, you know, at a lot of universities, students teach one course or maybe two sections of the same course. Um, and then depending on where you get a job, you might be teaching three courses with two preps, four courses with three preps. I mean, so it's, you know, you might have that change. So now you have to stay ahead of not only one class that you're used to teaching, but multiple. And so, you know, there are ways, obviously, to navigate that. Some places allow you to do double sections or, you know, reduce the number of preps or course releases for research and grant writing and all of these things. You know, there's, um, there's ways you can navigate that, at least initially, to, to help yourself bring that balance, you know, back to your life. <clears throat> but I would say that one of my biggest issues is absolutely this, this, this sort of logistical part of moving to a new, I've lived in four states in the past eight years, and just moving to a new state and getting acclimated and changing your address and making sure your partner has work. And, right, and, and you would think, oh, well, but it's exciting, and this is the best part. Of, you know, oh, this is all very exciting. I, I love to try new restaurants and bars, and that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, you know, where are you going to grocery shop? And where are your kids going to go to school? And, you know, these sorts of things can, can really take up a lot of your emotional and mental energy and space. And so now you want to be on your A-game, as you said, mm -hmm. in, in front of the classroom and with your research. But you also want to be on your A-game in terms of your life and mental health and yeah, get sleep balance. and eat well. And, you know, so I think that um, just the general transition, as you were saying, it can be very exciting, but even good stress is, is stress, right? So. 
And I would just add one other thing too. The first course you teach, there's so much more preparation in that first go round. So you have prep, to yeah. invest way more time on the new preparation than the fine tuning the second semester or the right. second year that you <clears throat> teach it. So right. allow a lot more time for that preparation. And if you can request to teach a course you've already taught, that's fantastic. I'm talking about how it's difficult for me and <clears throat> I'm teaching courses I've already taught before, but they're just updated and teaching more sections of them. So there are ways you can, you can negotiate that in your first year typically um, to help you out a little bit. And as a young faculty member, remember all those assignments you assign, no matter how rigorous you want those students to be, you have to eventually grade those assignments. That's right. Which means, and that's required. I'm having, I'm, and so you have to prioritize, I mean, we'll probably get into that balance teaching and research, but you have to yes. always think on the other side, like how much time am I going to spend grading? Right. Right. And is that going to take away at the end of the, I mean, the students aren't going to be as grateful for your feedback as you probably, you know, some yeah. of them will, but most of them, you know, won't as much as focusing on your research and, and making sure. So it's important in, in developing your classes to not get overly ambitious, which I think I probably did my first semester, yep, which was difficult. Yep. And I found myself grading all the time. Yep. Um, yep. And then I, I, everybody was happier the next semester when I taught the class, yeah. <laughs> including yeah. me. All right, and our next question is, what surprised you the most about your new faculty experience? Um, I guess I can start. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that surprised me the most was, I guess, how <clears throat> not different I felt. I mean, I, I guess <laughs> I, I think I'd always like to be involved. I, let me take that back. I was very involved in service in graduate school. I've been involved in sort of I, I don't know, I don't remember how you put it, but sort of these lofty goals or lofty expectations or you know, collecting your own data, doing your own transcription and data analyses and all of these things. And so I've always sort of wanted to have my hands in the pot. And so in some ways, it surprised me that even though I had these new responsibilities and I maybe had some of this identity transformation like you were talking about, I didn't feel fundamentally different. Like you're not going to go into a job and you're going to be a new person. It's not going to happen. Well, I, it's probably not going to happen that way. Maybe you will. But um, so for the most part, you're still you, and you still have whatever values you have and whatever ways of dealing with things that you have. And so your first couple years as a faculty member is to figure out, you know, how, how can we best navigate this? And so um, even though your role has changed and maybe your title has changed and, and hopefully at least your salary has changed, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be fundamentally different than you were. So if, for example, you have habits that you would like to change, you should change them now. Or, you know, if you have expectations for yourself, you should make a plan. Because it's not, uh, and I guess, like I said, that's not really a surprise, but I guess I thought I'd feel more, you know, like something drastic would have changed. And even after I got walked in my PhD ceremony, after I did my first year of my postdoc, second year of my postdoc, I'm like, huh, I'm really, really the same Vanessa, just different title, different money. Yeah. Uh, in my case, like uh, I think it goes back to one of the comments that you made about structured time versus unstructured time. Like even as a student, I had uh, when I have to do some task by a certain date, I know that I have 24 hours of time in a day because I can work any time because I would mm, sleep right. during any hours, work during any hours. It works however I want it to work. Uh, but once I became a faculty, I I was surprised by how how quickly your daytime fills up. You have to meet with certain yeah. people to uh, talk about certain ideas to per, to go seek funding. Uh, teachers, uh, students come to you asking for questions about assignments. So you will be very surprised how quickly your mm. entire day goes up and by the time you go back in the evening, you are tired obviously. But So it doesn't work out, uh, at least you don't have the comfort of uh, having the entire 24 hours. So I, it's, I, what I realize it's important to have certain parts of the day uh, just for yourself to think about what you want to do, what you want to work on. For instance, I, I keep my Friday afternoons uh, completely uh, free for myself. So that's when I don't give any student appointments or any research meetings. So that's just my time. Uh, look, I, I, previously I thought well, I will always find time, but time just skips by. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the surprises for me is like all the simple questions students would ask me that I did not know the answer to. I'm sick and I need to drop this semester. What do I do? Uh, what if I would do? When, do? when is the drop date for the class? And then all the complex little computer systems that come into play to do the most basic things. And so like here at ODU, 
every time you publish something, you have to go into a computer system, type in the publication, it's all these forms and fields, so the, when the provost runs a report, it shows that you're doing something. Uh, you have to, when you, you want to go in and log something, if you want to do something in Banner, you have to install Java on your computer in an em emulator and be, you know, and Banner is the, in other words, there's all these things that, there's all these computer systems that um, they're not necessarily simple to use, and I've asked people at other universities, and they all use these really horrible computer <laughs> systems. So it's not ODU, but um, but I think it was a, I think it was a surprise of how much I had to learn because there's all of these little policies that you maybe never had to use as a student, but you're going to if you have at least a hundred student random sample, you're going to have students who have almost every single possible unique situation that you're going to have to realize how does this department handle that. So. And I would piggyback on that and say ditto, because it was the same for me, and I'm still learning how to navigate a lot of the systems. But also, I think it was making sure that the students understand your expectations, because yes. even though it seems like it's very clear and you've spent a lot of time preparing it and you, you outline the expectations and say, if you have any questions, let me know, I'm still surprised how many students will say, I didn't understand. Or um, So just making sure that you try to engage as much as you can and make sure the expectations are clear because they may be very clear in your mind, but mm -hmm. there will be some students who just didn't hear what you were saying or didn't mm -hmm. process it. And, um, it's hard if they don't figure that out till the very end. Mm -hmm. So, And the surprising part there can be that uh, sometimes they don't ask you right. and you think, well, if you don't understand, why didn't you just right. come to me? Like, why, why didn't you email me? Why didn't we yeah. meet? Why didn't you come to my office hours? And so sometimes you have to preempt that. So. Uh, there was an assignment that I gave to students this semester, and they had to do several of the, it was the same prompt, but they had to do several of these assignments. And after grading a round of the first one, I said, I need to clear, even though I think this prompt is cl crystal clear, I sent it to colleagues to see what they thought based on issues I saw. I'm like, you know what, I need to revise this. And so I just sent an, an announcement via Blackboard to my students, said, based on common issues I saw, mm -hmm. I'm revising the prompt for clarity. Right. Um, and so hopefully, we'll, we'll see what happens on round two. But So I do think that's an element of, of this, you know, a surprising element here. But you can still, right. like you're saying, you can still try to um, uh, fix these problems before they really blow up. Right. And that was one of the tips, I think. You, you can fix problems in reasonable ways as long as you deal with them in a timely fashion. <laughs> Um, is what resources or support were available to you or that you utilized during your first year? For me, mentors. People yeah. who had already been here and navigated the system and had experience talking, teaching the courses. And for me, it was mentors that were my biggest resource and support. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give an example, too, as one of my roles is the opening the new clinic here. Having people who were familiar with the campus help navigate to help me put a team together that knew the ins and outs, almost the press box view from the university that of the, the hoops that we would need to jump through to open up the clinic and be successful or on other projects for academics. Um, having those connections was very, very helpful. I think, uh, I think that's, I, I have not been part of any structured mentoring program, but I, there's a senior professor who works in the same field, so I go to him for almost any question that I have. Uh, he puts me in contact with uh, any regional uh, person or staff in agencies which, are, which can potentially fund. So it's very important to have one person like that in the department. And also, it's also important to have someone not necessarily in your same field, but with whom you can discuss non-academic stuff, uh, worries about your tenure or uh, uh, how many publications a year is expected? Uh, mm -hmm. How what's the average funding that I should I'm expected to bring in? Things like this, which you can't obviously go and discuss with uh, your seniors who evaluate you, but someone who is more like a friend. Uh, yeah, and and also I try to talk to other peers who joined along with me. At least have another person who joined about the same time, and just to see and talk how they are doing and what problems and things they are facing so that you know how others who joined along with you are faring. I think that helps as well. There's a lot of, I mean, I, one of the things I would say is whenever you're negotiating your startup package, that's the maximum leverage you will have until you get tenure. And so make sure and negotiate everything possible in terms of resource and support you can get um, beforehand. Uh, and make sure the way you make that argument is you don't say all the things you want, you say, 
I need two monitors because I want to be more productive. I need $3,000 a year to travel for conferences because I want to go to these conferences and meet mm -hmm. with these scholars. I, and so you, you, may, you always make the case not, what I found at least with the salary negotiations, so this is a different little tag, is rather than asking for a huge bump in salary, making sure you ask for a huge bump in your startup package. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need course buyouts. Uh, and it shows your new department that you're interested in um, being productive. Uh, mm -hmm. It also, um, but the other thing I would say is, for me, I think the hidden secret in plain sight um, is uh, if you're not well connected, at least in my field, so I can only speak for my field, if you're not well connected to sources of data and people who are really influential in the field, you're not going to be very successful. Um, you can't be a lone ranger. And so uh, I've had to use partnerships to rely on other people's data sets, co-writing with other people, uh, just showing up to events and getting invited to stuff. Um, but I wouldn't have it without that social capital. And so like mm -hmm. all of that practical resources of like money to fly on a, on a plane. And then there's a very complicated computer system. You have to enter all that information to after you come back. Um, but I think that those are key resources. So really negotiate that startup package and, um, and try to make sure it maximize. It's like it's what you really want. It's going to maximize what you I might want. chime in one thing there, too. Don't hesitate to ask if admin support can help yeah. with some of that data entry for the computer so that you personally don't have to enter every single trip and every single receipt. Sometimes the admin support can be very helpful if it's available. Yeah, my department, the, the, uh, the admin folks have a, I don't remember what it's called, but it's basically they're your proxy or they're allowed to submit things for you. So um, all you have to do is click agree. <laughs> so it's, it's a beautiful thing. But um, yeah, I would say all the comments that the panelists have made, I would totally agree with. Um, just in general, you know, support from other folks in your department. A lot of times they'll stop by, you know, if you have your door open, hey, how's it going? Do you want to talk about anything? And yes, I always want to talk <laughs> about something that I'm, that's happening. So that, like you were saying, that informal support is just as important as any sort of formal um, uh, mentoring program that you have, but a lot of universities have resources that will uh, fit whatever the goals of that university are or whatever the goals of your school or college are. So a lot of us, I think, are very research oriented. Um, even though we probably love teaching, we, we are always interested in how to maximize research opportunities. And so, um, but if you go to a place that has um, it is more teaching focused, there are still grants and initiatives for you to, um, you know, prepare new courses online or for you to go to a conference to learn about new research that's in the field so that your uh, syllabi can be as up to date as possible and that sort of thing. So, so depending on what sort of university or school you um, end up in, there are all sorts of formal resources to, like you said, to get money to get on that plane to um, help you write a grant. Like there are, there are opportunities here, for example, that you can get a course release if you're writing a grant, a grant proposal, because those can take forever. Um, and so you need that time. Or, um, uh, you know, you can get a course release to develop an online course that you can then teach multiple times. And, and a lot, and like I said, I've been at several places, only one as a faculty member other than this one, but um, just places I've been, they offer a number of incentives for various different initiatives. And so, um, you know, help with your teaching portfolio, help with, um, you know, as you said, getting a, an admin, or a, um, a re you were talking about with travel, but in terms of data collection, you might be able to get a research assistant assigned to you, and then you can collaborate. And so there's all sorts of different resources that you just need to check out. Um, you know, there's pots of summer money that you can get. I have a project I was going to work on during the summer, and um, I just applied for a summer grant here from the university. I don't know if I'll get it. That's not the point. It's that the opportunity is out there, and you pursue it, and often that reflects very well on you when you apply for other internal grants or other external grants. Um, so the fact that you're a go-getter in whatever your responsibilities are, that's important. You know, So even if you don't get that grant, you at least had good practice, and you can maybe parlay that grant application into another one or that sort of thing. So there's a ton of resources that are maybe not publicized. You sometimes have to dig around for internal and external um, opportunities. And, and I'll, I'll add to, to, to Vanessa's comment, because the other, the other thing that surprised me when I started here at OBU about eight years ago, was how many orientations yeah. they had for <laughs> yeah, that's true. new Should've faculty. Said that. <laughs> so there was new faculty orientation, you know, two weeks before the semester started. And then yeah. there was an Office of Research yep. orientation. And then uh, the Center for Learning and Teaching here at yep. OBU did new faculty. Yeah. Yep. I have another training. one this Saturday all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the library does an orientation yep. using library resources. Right. 
I felt that the, that first two semesters, I was constantly <laughs> in orientation, learning about new things. That's true. And, and that really kind of surprised me because I knew all these cool things, but I was so swamped that I never got to use it. Probably like um, three years later, I finally <laughs> got to you know using some of the new technology or you know actually using Prezi. You know, like, um, all this stuff like oh, that's really cool. To my little to do later <laughs> folder. <laughs> um, so take advantage of those orientation. Right opportunities when when they come up particularly you know just to to get a basic understanding of what resources um, are available yeah. right. because yeah. for example the student support part for me was always very surprising my first semester I had to deal with the student um ombuds and I, I didn't even uh, know mm -hmm. uh, you, you know what the role of the faculty was so that was a learning that was a learning experience Mm -hmm. For me, in my my first semester as as a new faculty member, mm -hmm. so there are a lot of resources, from you know, for research, for teaching, um, and for dealing with students and for providing student support. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's you, you know you learn and you file it for later use, right. <laughs> and others you might be able to capitalize um, almost almost immediately. Right. And but, many of the yeah. resources are online too. Mm -hmm. Like for even an orientation for something, if you forgot something from the orientation, you can go back and find a yeah, lot they of things post online. Yeah. So that's nice too. And then you can do it at a time that fits better into your life. Mm -hmm. Finding that fit sometimes is a little bit. <laughs> right. right. Another quick resource is that the assistant professors in my, in my department have banded together. We've kind of formed a support group. Uh, and it's not a brag everything you've accomplished group, which is sometimes, I mean, sometimes you can feel a lot of pressure as a new faculty because everybody tells you about their, their successes. Nobody comes in and announces that they've gotten rejected for the last three times. And as a result, you kind of need a support group and it's hard, I mean, it's seeking those people out. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to have a, um, a profess, you know, a professional relationship, you do talk about work, but it's also a support group um, to help you through the process. That's a, that's a socio, uh, you know, that's a, a social, um, it's a like a, it's a social support type of resource that um, mm -hmm. is really important because you're, you're going to fail. I mean, just by pure you know math, uh, if you if you you know hit all the things, you're going to fail, uh, and Repeated. you just have to navigate that. And it helps uh, have a social group to support you in that. Mm -hmm. And outside of the, your department too. I mean, there there are some amazing groups on this campus, but on many campuses um, that you can go to. And these are folks who are in different departments who might still be at your same level or facing your same challenges, but you know you can uh, hang out with them socially and then still come in and complain to them in the office. You know, and so it was really. Um, I was really pleased that within, I think, a month of being here, I had gone out socially with several people outside of my department that I had met through various um, functions on campus. And they're fantastic resources as well to get you a, make you think about things a different way, you know, especially if they're in a different college or different department. Um, you know, that's, that's always um, a good way to, to think about what you're doing from a different perspective, but also to have some fun. I mean, um, I don't know about you all, but... I have a lot of things I like to do that are that are outside of the university. So um, just that general, the general, you know, friend friend support <laughs> that we all need. All right. And our next question, we kind of go to a little bit of what yeah. we've already talked about. How do you balance the different expectations of teaching, research, and service? And actually, before we get into that, let me pose a, a little bit more of an introductory question. How did you learn about, or how did you? figure out what were the expectations of you in terms of teaching, research, and service. And then we can kind of talk about the different balancing. Sometimes I'm not sure that that's always clear. To me, that was one of the surprises. Like, when I got in there, I was like, yeah, I know how to do the research. Um, and then my first year there, I was asked to create a brand and market and, and implement a brand new undergraduate minor. Uh, it, you know, so, so that, that was a struggle to figure out what I was actually expected to do as a first year, second year assistant professor. So if you could speak first to how do you figure out what those expectations are? Uh, I mean, in terms of teaching, at least in my case, it was uh, part of the startup negotiation, I guess. I mean, yeah. I knew pretty much what I'm going to teach for the first two years. I don't, yeah. Although I don't know the exact courses, I do know the number of courses and my course load for my first two years. So there was no confusion there. And in terms of research, uh, no one gives you a 
quantified number about yeah. this is the dollar amount that you should bring in there is no such written rule even during the tenure process at least that's what people told me until now uh, but uh, but uh, being actively uh, i mean i at least expected to write a lot of uh, proposals competitive proposals that, that was expected of me and i knew that uh, and publications it, it varies from field to field but uh, if, if I press hard, I got, the number I got was two at least in engineering. Any year is uh, is uh, is expected of any new faculty. Uh, but service, uh, I, I, at least in my department, the chair uh, he he supports and does not give you a lot of service responsibilities at least for the first two years. I'm I'm serving on two university committees, one for IRB and another <coughs> for transportation and parking committees, but. Compared to what some of the other senior faculty do, it's it's I would say it's minimal. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's again part of uh, how what kind of a relationship you have with your uh, uh, chair. You, usually, the department chair and senior faculty they try to take a lot more service responsibilities during the initial year yeah. so that you can focus on course development and research. That's what had happened until now in my case. Do you guys want to go first? I'm a little different, non-tenure. Yeah. Do you, oh, no, it's up to you. Um, so from my perspective, I'm in a non-tenure track right now. So research is not a requirement for what I'm doing. So I also knew what my teaching expectations would be when I came in. So my primary role is teaching and then service as well. And a big part of the service that I'm doing is related to ODU Monarch Physical Therapy and providing physical therapy services for our campus and for the entire community. Um, another role for my service has to deal with entrepreneurship here because there is a humongous effort on campus for entrepreneurial um, innovation. And when you have good ideas, not to be afraid to get them out there. And that's not always consistently aligned with the scholarly requirements of publications in the top tier journals and some of those things. So working together to kind of find the best of both of those worlds. Um, but for me personally right now, my research arm is completing my dissertation. So I'm in the middle of completing a dissertation that hopefully will lead to a center of clinical excellence here at the university. So um, research is still a part of what I need to do, although it's not part of um, my specific role at the university. So hopefully I'll have that done by next year or this summer. Well, mine is a little bit different. So um, it's sort of a ca cautionary tale is <laughs> included in it. Um, so as I mentioned, I uh, did a postdoc before this, and um, I had a, I had talked, I had talked to the uh, administration there, um, uh, and uh, had an idea for what my um, duties would be, and I knew what that was, and we wrote up sort of a contract that was sort of um, vague enough that if those changed, that was fine. Um, and within two months of me going there, the administration completely changed. So all, so my job became. A moving target. So uh, luckily, they didn't dissolve my position. It was a two, like I said, it was a two-year postdoc, and luckily they didn't dissolve it. I was able to just parlay that into other things that were consistent with the contract that uh, that was written. Um, it still ended up being fantastic. Uh, I would sing postdoc praises uh, <laughs> all day, um, but I absolutely went through this moment of I knew exactly what I was doing. I had been telling people for four or five months what I was going to be doing when I got there, and then I got there and my whole life changed. And so I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, I don't think if, you know, if you're moving into a tenure track line or that sort of thing, typically that doesn't happen um, for the most part. Uh, but if you're taking a temporary job or a non-tenure track job or a postdoc, you might have some of those things change. So you need to try to figure that out ahead of time. Like I said, protect yourself with a contract. Uh, you know, that those things are all good. Um, but so here, because I had had that experience, I started asking, when I went on the market, I started asking places, even at the phone or Skype interview stage, what are your expectations for incoming faculty for research, teaching, and service? I mean, that was one, when they say, do you have any questions? They're expecting, oh, what's the teaching? Well, oh, no, I'm all over it because I want to I want to be sure that I know what I'm what I'm coming into. And then, as you said, the the negotiation phase, you've already been on the campus visit at that point, or at least you've done several phone or Skype interviews if it's a place that doesn't do campus invites. And so if you draft an MOU like a to, to your chair and say, uh, I'm, you know, I'm agreeing to this offer. 
with these things agreed upon or with this is my understanding of what you're offering because oftentimes you'll sign a letter or you'll tell the dean of the school or the department that you're agreeing to the contract before you've actually seen it or before you've gotten all your paperwork from academic <laughs> affairs. I think I got my packet from academic affairs several weeks at least. It, it was probably more than that after I had accepted a job and told other places I'm out of the running for your job, right? So, so you need to figure it out. And this is how all places work. This is not about ODU and they're funky. Oh no, it's very common for you to agree to an offer before you see the whole paper, you know, everything there. So I would say definitely try to get it in writing, try to nail it down. Well, don't try to. Nail it down as much as you can in terms of these things. Um, and like I said, on your campus visit, ask people, what are the expectations? You know, the more that you get from different people is good. Um, and even though a lot of places won't tell you exactly how much you need in terms of publications or grants, some places do. Some places have formulas where they say, okay, a peer-reviewed publication is worth two points. A non-peer-reviewed publication is worth 0.5 points, and they will—they have formulas. There, are, at least in my field, criminology and criminal justice, there are some departments that they have formulas, and that's the end of the discussion. I'm a book writer, and so some places don't count books for anything, and some places count them very highly, or some places count them somewhere in the middle. And so you need to find out whatever you're doing if that's consistent with what that department values. So any of the places I went to, if they said, "No, nope, your two books are going to count for nothing." Bye. Take me out. Take me out of the. I mean, it's it's just not possible for me to succeed at a place like that. So, um, and I'm not saying you need to know that on the market, but you at least need to you need to know what's expected of you very early on before you accept an offer. You know, you can't figure out everything, but definitely that's. I should, probably should have put that in my in my tips. Um, you, you know, when you're on the campus visit, that's your time to collect all the information. When you're considering an offer, you need to talk about it then. Um, with faculty and with your chair, and typically, I think your chair or your dean will be on your side. They want the best, you know. They want the best for you. But um, I would say start early, start very early, in figuring out what it is. Sorry for that long answer, but like I, yeah, this is. <laughs> I think my only thing, I mean, a couple of myths, or I would say, uh, do smart service, not no service. Uh, yeah. Your partner department loves when you're a good citizen, but smart service is services that going to help you with your research usually. Yeah. Uh, it's going to help you uh, be viewed as a valued citizen in your department. So, um, you know, you always hear warnings about service, but trying to reframe that um, to say, I want to make new connections, go into the Women's right. Caucus here at ODU is a great right. way to make connections. Yes, it um, is. Serving on committees like the IRB, you get to know the people who are going to be evaluating you at the college and department right. level. Remember, your, depart your review eventually will be by your program, your department, your college, the dean, the department, or the, the department chair, the provost, and then all these external reviewers. And if you don't know any of them through service, then that's not to your benefit. It's right. much better if they know something about you, especially right. if they don't have a formula. If they right. have a formula, then you're, you know, <laughs> tough. Um, and then uh, with teaching, the only thing I would say about adjusting is, you know, I think we all learn teaching by doing it poorly and picking one thing to improve on every year, but not trying to try, not trying to change yourself into Mr. Holland's opus. You know, in one semester, uh, you just can't. There's going to be a lot. There's a lot to learn. Just kind of do one thing at a time. You know, this next year I'm just going to work on this, and you just tell tell that to the people who are going to be reviewing you. You know, I got a lot to work on teaching. I'm going to work on this, and be gener if like, be generous with yourself because um, you know, you, you teaching is never a it's a it's a it's an art for sure. Mm -hmm. These formulas that they have, uh, how flexible are they for including life experience? Because uh, I'm like I'm a retired military officer, mm -hmm. so if they say, "Well, you know, you've never done any sabbaticals in in the Middle East, your target area," well, no, I've done three sabbaticals in Iraq and two in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Does life experience translate over, or are they really looking for the official research fellowship, the official sabbatical, things like that? Well, if you're in a clinical position or that sort of uh, that's they would really care about that, but I mean, yeah, you can definitely speak to that more than I would. But I, but I just know that I don't want to scare people. That I, I think formulas are actually not the norm, um, but I think that at least getting at sort of the kernel of your question in terms of uh, do different places value certain things that other places don't? That's absolutely true, and you just need to find out. You just need to say straight up, I, I have this. Um, uh, uh, extensive background in XYZ, is that something you would value? And often in the job ads, they'll say mm -hmm. clinical experience preferred or military experience preferred. They will say that straight out. And so usually it's not, it's not that ambiguous, but 
Do you want to? Well, I was just going to say you can maximize it too if that experience is aligned with your passion. Right. right. If, it, if that experience is aligned with your teaching and research and service, that is a real strength. If it's Absolutely. completely outside of what your new career is, that might be a little bit yeah. harder. But I think if you can align those things, it would clearly bring value. And you can often frame it very strategically, where you can say, my lived experience as X, Y, Z. I mean, I say that numerous times in, in the publications that I have, you know, my, based on my advocacy work, based on my experience doing X, Y, Z. And so I think it's, it's important to make sure that it makes sense for your trajectory or for ho holistically who you are as a scholar, as a teacher. I think that's really the way to go. I think you're right. So every three years, ODU participates in what's called the COACH survey. It's a survey of faculty. It's the data that um, Harvard, um, all, the univer uh, all universities participate in this survey. And, and consistently, assistant professors say the tenure requirements are ambiguous. But that's true at all universities. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a formula, and the more likely the case I, I, would, I would recommend is more likely the case is you have to be proactively framing yourself as a scholar, yeah. mm -hmm. a national leader. Right. So making people, making in the way you write your cover letter and your performance reviews, you have to kind of actively frame because most of the time there isn't going to be this formula. And uh, I, I, I like it too when a student says, well, how many references are required, Dr. Glass, right? Well, uh, I know when you haven't done enough and I know when you've done way too much and you're kind of, and so I think that's kind of where our promotion and tenure comes in. It is, is a little bit of a judgment call. You know, yeah. you can blow past it and it's a clear judgment call. You can eat by, but if you, um, if you balance these things, if you're a good citizen, you're a good teacher, like a place like ODU, it's the other thing you should know is they, they do weight teaching and research relatively evenly. I mean, maybe a slight tip up to the research, but they do consider yeah. your teaching. It is important. The institution I came from, you could be a terrible teacher, yeah. a terrible, I mean, unless yeah. you were getting ones and twos in your yeah. performance reviews, yeah. you are still teaching and you're employed. Yeah. Um, and so the institutions are going to weight these things differently. Um, and so fit is a yeah. good. Right. And I might add one thing too, to get the best feedback from your students, maybe consider leaving a little bit of time in one of the courses for those evaluations to actually occur. Yeah. So you get a large number of evaluations because if you don't do that, you may typically yeah. see the students who love yeah. you or who have a negative opinion right. and not really capture the true representation of what your teaching did. And so I think that can be very helpful too because it's nice if everybody would just submit that they were happy, but you don't really know. And then right. if you get a couple people who are really upset, that could really skew yeah. your scores on your evals. So I would just say maybe consider a way to make sure that your students really do participate in that process. In my department, actually, mainly looks at the last book. Overall, this person is a good professor. So I'll tell my students, even if you don't fill out the whole survey, please fill out that last question. Right. I mean, in, in the end class. And so sometimes if you know what your department is going to look at, um, it, you know, you might get slightly higher responses. Or if you want constructive comments. I mean, I think most of us want to actually improve our, our teaching. And so you might need to say, okay, you... You know, whether you do the online eval is one thing, but can you at least fill, fill out some anonymous comments to me? And even though you might not be able to include them in your teaching portfolio or your tenure packet, you at least can work towards that in the future to help improve your teaching and that sort of thing. But I would say if, if we're on the question of how do you um, balance it or how, what do you give, give priority to, I think this is a really good point. Um, some places, including probably two of the places I've been at, um, they really don't care so much about your teaching um, as long as you're, you're research productive. And I, I think that's not good in, in many ways. But um, uh, so in some places, it's, it's not as obvious, though. It might be a little coded where you go in the interview and all they talk about are, is research or all they talk about are grants or all they talk about are mentoring doctoral students. They don't talk about university committees. They don't talk about teaching. And that's OK. If you, want, if you want to be at that kind of, I mean, everyone has their own, um, their own uh, interests, right? And so if you want to be at that sort of place, that's great. You just need to listen for the cues. If they say, we're really interested in improving pedagogy, or you know, we're, we're really up on the pedagogical literature, OK, clearly, your teaching is what's going what's gonna to matter. And some places will straight up tell you. They'll say, when you go for tenure, we care that you either have very strong teaching or very strong research, and the service might be the deciding vote, or something like that. So often, again, it's still ambiguous, but at least you know sort of where to, to maximize your, your time and effort. But I would say a comment that someone made earlier in terms of um, uh, having a sacred time where, you know, th this is what I'm going to get done during this time. And um, I would also say work in ways that, that 
makes sense for your working style. So I used to be able to write, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, and it was great when I had that magical unstructured time. But nowadays, I really don't have those eight hour chunks. And instead of feeling down on yourself, you say, okay, you know what, today, I'm just going to commit to three hours, or I'm going to commit to writing three pages or something like that. as long as you keep moving forward I think that's the important thing it's really easy in your first year to say I'm too overwhelmed with this I'm not gonna touch it for a month and that will hurt when you pick it back up I was scared of some of the projects I was working on because I didn't touch them for weeks and so uh, just just keep moving forward like I said be, be reasonable with yourself you know if you can only devote three hours or you can only devote Friday afternoon for sure magic magic uh, uh, untouchable time um, that's something definitely to to be aware of. Um, and also, I would say you should pick some, some untouchable time for something you enjoy, you know, going out on a date with your partner, uh, you know, doing something with your children, engaging in a hobby that you like, seeing a movie. Um, anyone who tells you, well, I only got tenure because I worked 20 hours a day for six years, they wouldn't be alive if they worked 20 hours a day for six I'm serious about that. You are going to work, but you also have to live. You have to live your life. So I would say put, put, Time for yourself too, right. that, or else all of these things will suffer. Right, and that includes sleep. Sleep, and recreation, yes. fitness, and just decompression yes. time are very, very important to schedule with yourself because they can get pushed to the back burner. Yeah. And you really need them for the best productivity and life health. Yeah, absolutely. Where does this service component, uh, like the service component, and when you go for a job, do you already? I mean, is it something that the department is already doing and you then get involved in it? Or is it something that you already uh, involved with and where does this complement come from? Yeah, I mean, I think some other people can address this too. Um, that uh, So in my case, I sort of moved over some of the students I had been working with or some of the projects I had been doing. I didn't just drop those. You know, I just, they're now included in what I'm doing now. Um, but in terms of the service assignments, often your, your department might say to you, we'd really like to have, um, you know, a, a junior faculty member on this committee, or we'd really like you to do this, but we're going to wait until next year because it's really work intensive and we don't want you, that, that happened to me this year where they really wanted me on a committee and then they thought, oh, wait a minute, we should probably protect her <laughs> from this committee. Um, so I think, I think some of it that you're already involved in, I would say don't drop that. Um, unless it's something that has no applicability to what you're doing now, don't drop it. Keep, keep doing what you're doing, especially if you serve on your, I mean, I'm really involved in the American Society of Criminology. <laughs> I organize panels for the, the um, annual meeting. I'm involved in mentoring groups there. I'm involved in some of the divisions. And so that's very pertinent to what I'm still doing. I'm not going to stop that. And you will actually get credit for that too. Service to your discipline, service to your department, service to your university, co-authoring with graduate students, co-authoring with undergraduate students, those things all look good. And some of us who've been at multiple places sort of have trails that mm -hmm. we're leaving. You know, but, but I think you can bring, as long as they work for what you're doing, I think it's, it's fine. Is that, 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 did that answer your question? It's fine to bring it in. Yeah, okay. okay. And I would almost see, this is the way at least I see service. Um, there's department, college, university, nation, and almost right. year after year, you're adding layer upon layer. So right. you really do start service your department. Your department right. has to review curricular changes, be on that right. committee. Your department has to actually review, well, you can't be on the academic personnel committee. Right. Your department has all kinds of things it's trying to do. Then maybe, then kind of grow out to the college. And then eventually, then maybe, I mean, maybe by the time you get tenure, maybe the university service, which is not necessarily a requirement. But the one thing I think the, the slight difference would be is um, your committee and especially your reviewers uh, outside, the outside, the external reviewers eventually when you go for tenure, um, you need to have a national reputation, and right. so national service yeah. uh, at, in your professional organization, right. picking one or two strategically, and then going really deep where people do know you, so when they get your materials, they know who they're reviewing, even right. though uh, you've never co-published with them, so that's right. a requirement, you can't have co-published. Um, and so, but slowly build out, um, at the same time work, working with whatever national organization you can. I mean, I'm on the textbook committee here, I didn't know that, I was on the WordPress committee here. Uh, I mean, there are all these committees all the time that you can be on um, that, uh, you know, that, and by the way, that maybe that's a strategy too. The textbook committee is great because you get lunch, they meet once a semester, and it's like an hour-long meeting. And, uh, but there's other committees that, you know, require, like a search committee requires lots and lots tons, and lots of work. Tons, and yeah. so um, the idea that you can do a quick and easy, oh, I'll be on the textbook committee, um, it's the same line on your, uh, on your, on your CV. 
the junior faculty was when I was asked to run a committee to say, not to not to respond immediately, but to right. think about that yes. and actually go back and ask people to run that committee. What are yes. the actual requirements? Yes. Um, and you know, nobody so far had ever gotten angry with me for saying, you know, what, I I would love to, but I'm not able to serve on that committee. I've yeah. not gotten into any real major trouble with people on those committees for you know declining the opportunity mm -hmm. to serve with them. But I, I, yeah. I used to tend to rush into, okay, sure. Yeah. And I realized very quickly that let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And then saying no by email is different than saying no in person. Right. <laughs> but I think a lot of departments would say to you as a new person, you should practice saying no. You you they might want you on there because you're the fresh face and oh this is our new hire. Hooray! But um but they want you to do what they hired you to do and so they don't want you to be involved in, in too much stuff. But I will say if, if it's something that you think won't take a ton of time and will be fun and will still get you a line on your C V like this, you know. My, my chair is very excited that I'm doing this. And he said, thanks for that service. You're going to represent us. It's going to be great. And so that already, and this is fun. Like, I would have said yes to this no matter what. And so, but then, oh, here's this bonus, you know, where your chair counts that as you being involved in the university community and contributing to the intellectual life and growth of the university. And so um, if there are, as you were sort of saying, sort of easy or fun or, or, or um, reasonable time commitments, then, then definitely do those, I would say. So here's the other fun part. How do you juggle work and life? <laughs> <laughs> or do you juggle? Let's put it that way. I mean, uh, I mean, at least in my case, uh, however busy I am, at least uh, uh, it's not like I'm working 20 hours or 16 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, even if I'm thinking about something, most of the time it's worrying about something than doing something about it. So instead, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think uh, there is no necessity or there is no reason why you should uh, why you should work at the expense of uh, your other time. So you, I think you should always be able to find time for other things, uh, for sports or uh, hanging out with friends. I think that should not be a problem. Even if I mean, I did get some advice when I went to some committees that you are expected to work 70 hours a week or 60 hours a week. Uh, I was scared, but usually, uh, even the, the actual time, which uh, which is like the most productive time, or with the time where you generate a really path-breaking idea, it's going to be some 15, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. It's most of the mm. time thinking about it, right? Yeah. So I, I think. It's not a really very difficult thing. We just need to make a commitment to that. And I will say for me right now, I am working very long hours. I'm on campus probably a minimum of 12 to 14 hours a day, but I have a big passion for what I'm mm. doing. So a lot of what I do every day, it does not seem like work right, because right, right. I really do love what I do. But I still, I do still need to talk, carve out that time for physical fitness, for good nutrition, for um, socializing with family and friends and having those pieces on it but when you really love what you do you can get a lot done and even if the days are long it's not agonizing to be at what you're doing so I would hope that that would match well with what you've been studying and what you plan to teach that it is something that you really have a passion for so uh, yeah. allocate uh, time uh, and related to that like one of the things I noticed is um, like not all of my work I find interesting, right? Like the parts of it which I am very excited and like about, parts of it which I'm not very excited. For instance, if there is any project I'm very excited and passionate when I'm working on the technical part of things, solving the math and doing the analytics, when I have to finally come down and do the literature search, uh, write a report, yeah. write the report, that, that's, I'm very slow and I don't find it interesting. Or So I, I, I take up a lot of time and keep postponing it. So <laughs> it depends on how to balance that also. So not, not all the work, even if I'm passionate about transportation engineering, not all aspects of working on it I find interesting. So That's what your students are for. <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, Parker Palmer is a, a author at Educated. He said one time that a, burning, burn, a burnout is not the result of giving too much. It's trying to give what you do not have to give. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that was always an interesting take. We think of burnout as somebody's working too hard, too many hours, 
but to, to your point, we do what we love, and I think you don't get burnt out when you are doing that, but you do get burnt out when you feel like you're being driven to do research that you don't care about. Right. Uh, you're teaching in a way that you don't feel is authentic. Um, you're doing service in a way that's trying to please some kind of external person rather than being kind of self-directed. Mm -hmm. I mean, this. Uh, I mean, this could be kind of a, um, uh, a cavalier way to put it, but I mean, I guess my attitude has been, at least I've tried to bring myself to, is like, if ODU doesn't want to give me tenure, that's fine with me. I don't want to be at this place yeah. if, if I can't be myself, mm -hmm. uh, and which means I'm not going to be, you know, certain, I don't have certain strengths in research. I don't. I don't have certain strengths as a teacher, and I have to balance all these. I have to do, I have to be a faculty member the way Chris Glass is, and that's going to be different than anyone on this panel. Uh, and so I've always said when I'm burnt out, it's because I'm not being myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm being kind of driven by some kind of externality, uh, some kind of force of, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, um, you know, numbers or uh, pressure or too high of expectations mm -hmm. for yourself rather than just being kind of more compassionate towards yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And good stress, the research does show that good stress is healthy. It actually has a very healthful effect on your body, and it's the negative stress that is the um, unhealthy thing. So you have to keep all that in perspective, too. Stress isn't always bad. If we didn't have any stress, we'd be dead. There's, <laughs> so, uh, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think uh, in terms of juggling work and life. I mean, my comments already have suggested that you really should do that. And as um, non-spontaneous or romantic as it sounds, you should. I mean, if you need to schedule, to, like to schedule time with your partner, or schedule time with your hobby, or get you know. I'm going, we're going to this place or this event on this day and you know that that's what it is because if if and if now you find yourself being pulled in all these different directions you need to approach it in terms of managing your time better and anyone would manage their time better by making lists or making schedules or or figuring out what to prioritize or not so I would say if you have to yeah you you know uh, or, or eat dinner, like my, uh, my partner and I try to eat dinner together every night, even though sometimes I get home and we're eating dinner at 10, 15 p.m., which is probably not healthy, um, you know, it just, you know, uh, and so one of our stresses moving here was we sold our dining room table before we moved, and when we got, I think I was complaining to you about this, I'm like, I'm trying to find a new dining room table that we like, because without it, we can't do our ritual of eating at least breakfast or dinner, you know, one or the other together, having time together every day, and I really was complaining about a dining room table, but it's not about the table, right? It's about what that represents in your life. Um, so yeah, I would say go by the table, eat dinner <laughs> together, uh, do that sort of thing. Um, but uh, some, somebody else said something really good that I wanted to, but I don't know, I don't know. But de definitely, if you, if you have to schedule it, for sure, do that. But um, I totally agree that when you're doing something you love, it feels like so much fun. And even though sometimes I leave courses and I, I'm feeling exhausted, I'm thinking, oh, my students had really great insights today. I'm really excited. But then when I'm grading 60 of those papers, I'm thinking, why did I assign so many of these papers? You know? so, so you just need to figure out a way to parlay that into that fun, exciting part. And I totally agree that there are some times where you can work 12 or 14 hours a day. And as long as you love it, it's great. You don't get burned out. It's when you're being, like you said, being driven by these external things that that also I think what frustrates me the most is if I'm doing something that I think is taking up a lot of my time and I think it's not doing anything for anyone you know like it's not helping my career my students aren't getting better my doctoral students aren't getting any comments you know is the university even going to read this is anybody going to do it you know that's what's frustrating and so you need to figure out how to cut out that you know tr trim the fat so to speak of, of what what's happening in your life I think for me, work-life balance is always a, was was a little bit more of a struggle because I started my, you know, my faculty career with a six-month-old baby. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you know, you, I, and my husband had when he moved here decided he was going to be a stay-at-home dad for a little bit. And so I'm working productively in the office, and I check, and then a Facebook notice says we're at the zoo. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so so you know, for, that was for me the first two years was really really hard because. There was also, going back to this issue of expectation, my department had just not tenured a woman. Uh, it seemed like every week, some of the senior faculty would be in my office, have you published anything yet? <laughs> and, and so that yeah. type of external <laughs> yeah. pressure was also um, adding stress to balancing just you know the different components of work. And then new house, new baby, mm -hmm. new all kinds of other things. So, that was always something that I, I struggled with in, in my first 
two years, but I also made sure that I made, you know, I played volleyball. And so mm. when things got stressful, we would go to the beach and play volleyball or try, try to do things to keep you, mm -hmm. to keep you sane. And there were days, whether it's Wednesday, we won't play volleyball until Friday. One more day. <laughs> One more day. Um, so generally the work and life balance, I think, is, is really critical to keeping mm -hmm. that, that sanity and to keep plugging away because yeah. tenure is not a sprint. Yeah. You know, it's basically five, four and a half, five years of continual plugging away, mm -hmm. you, you know, not just in doing teaching, research, and service, and getting out there in the community of scholars. And so yeah. you can't afford to get burned out by year two. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, and I think now we get to, um, we, everybody should have a handout that are the tips and advice from some of our, some of our panelists. And also there's actually some tips from an, another panelist who was unable to participate. But I really kind of just wanted to, open this up to our panelists for uh, advice and tips that you would offer to a potential new faculty member to help them manage the transition and be successful. And so you can read off of your list <laughs> or elaborate as needed. Um, but Lisa, I think you're going to have to leave soon sure. if you wanted to just start. Well, I think um, some of the things that I th hope that I've conveyed to you is really have a passion for what you're doing and the track that you're going to follow because yeah. that will really help revitalize you mm -hmm. um, if you're doing things that you really enjoy doing. And then each day I really try to reflect, um, maybe if it's even just on the drive home, what are three things that happened today? Not even thinking good or bad, but just sort of take a little bit <coughs> of time to recap and identify three things that happened in the day and then three things that I think went really well during that experience, because sometimes you can beat yourself up if you mm -hmm. do feel like there's a lot of pressure, but find three things that you think really went well that day and three things that you could improve on. And I think just taking that little bit of time has helped me um, through some rocky roads, through some things that are very exciting. But um, And then also I think um, really making sure for everything you do that you're very well prepared for it. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that preparation, especially in your first year of teaching, is go a long way. And if you invest on the front end, then you will just be fine-tuning and building off your foundation. But if you don't invest that time and really try to build a solid foundation early, you're going to keep going back and trying to rebuild the foundation. Um, uh, in my case, uh, I mean, this is an advice I received from the seniors when I was trying to decide whether I should continue in academia or go, uh, whether I should continue in a job or come back to academia. Uh, for me, I, I think uh, it's, it's, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like treat the first five years before the tenure process as uh, a five-year postdoc. Uh, I, I, I want to work on everything that I'm passionate about. I will give it my best. Uh, and. Uh, that, that's the best I can do. That's what I have in my control, but I, I will not be too bogged down by uh, I'm meeting the expectations. It can be a little tiring and stressful, but if, if, if uh, thinking about the best and worst case scenarios kind of put things back into perspective, I think that helps. Uh, and the other thing is being a little flexible with your uh, research plans. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you will not get the opportunity to put all your ideas into practice once you come to it. Academia, so uh, try to identify alternative uh, avenues for uh, streamlining your ideas, maybe publications, collaborations, uh, independent work, things like those. Not all, you'll not be able to always find an NSF funded project for your ideas. That's what I'm trying to say. And the third thing is uh, have mentors, both professional mentors and also uh, friends or colleagues with whom you can talk about everything that is. Uh, that's related to work or family or life. Those are the three key things. Um, so I, I wrote some things here, uh, but one of the things that's not written here is uh, there's another quote from, I, I quote something from Ann Dillard, and write, a wonderful book called The Writing in Life. Uh, if you do writing for a living, it's a, a wonderful uh, reflection. But she shares a story in there where she says, uh, she asked a master painter one time, how do you become a master painter? And the master painter replied, you love the smell of paint. And uh, I think what that says is master painter is about achieving some kind of position, but you have to love paint. And I think 
Uh, all of us love something about our work. There's a reason you're interested in being a faculty member. And I think continuously falling in love with why you first came to this field, why you came to this topic, why you wanted to be a professor, um, it's really important because that's the craft. And I think if you're a craftsman, you want to do really good work. And so we, in many ways, as scholars, are also craftsmen. I mean, the things that we create, um, they take so much time. They're appreciated often. They're, if they're a fine craft, they're not necessarily appreciated by a popular audience. Uh, but there's a great deal of satisfaction that comes with doing really good work. And I think eventually, I, I think at least I can, and I'm not an artist, my, my wife is, but I'm not an artist, but I, I can appreciate work for its own sake, not necessarily for its popularity. Um, and so uh, I think that's one of the things. And then I think the other, a couple other things I would just highlight um, is uh, develop a mentoring network. I've never found an Uber mentor. I can't tell you, I couldn't name a person who's a mentor for me right now. Outside of lots of, I know lots of people I can call on for different things um, across the country here at ODU, um, but uh, it's good to develop a network of people, or, or in my experience, it has been a network of people. And then also just kind of remember the tenure clock has already started, even though you're wrap, maybe wrapping up your PhD here, uh, it, that clock is ticking because it typically takes a year, year and a half for something to go to publication, uh, which means if it gets accepted, uh, you're already about a year and a half dead on day one. And so um, you probably heard that, but get a running start. Uh, and then partner, 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 partner. I mean, time well spent is time making new relationships, forming new research collaborations, uh, not going it alone. And so um, that's time well spent. Um, yeah, so I think I've already sort of talked about all the uh, tips that I gave on this sheet. Um, but um, definitely one of the things that I can add that I didn't really mention is, is this issue of organizational culture. So a lot of campus um, communities are communities, you know, where there's people who go to events, there's, to oh my goodness, if you look at ODU's event calendar, there's literally at least one event every single day, I think. Um, and if you go to all of them, you know, you can't do that because uh, you won't get your work done. But, I mean, just in the time I've been here, there's been advocacy groups meeting on campus, there have been several art installations, documentaries, um, uh, speakers, writers, so even things that are maybe not in your field, there were some fantastic writers here for the, the literary series. I mean, just amazing uh, stuff happening. And so I would say that if you can go to those events um, and you can see what else is going on in the intellectual life at, at your campus community, um, like I said, you can meet friends there. It can just be your, you know, I've been working all day and here, here's something I can go to at 6 p.m. Um, you know, th there's just all different ways that you can, you can make that work for you. Um, and uh, that can just contribute, obviously, to what's happening here at the university, but also can make you, you know, it doesn't feel like work. It feels more like fun. Um, and so definitely go to things, you know, get your face out there, be seen. Um, but, but yeah, in general, I think, um, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's the same you. Uh, you just might have different responsibilities now. And so, um, you know, ho hopefully our tips have been helpful. <laughs> All right, and so I think that's the kind of structured part of it. So now I'd like to open it up for question and answer, or question from the audience and answers, hopefully from our panelists. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, right there. Um, I know that this one would at least apply to Vanessa. I don't know if everyone has had the same experience. Um, but I'm potentially gearing up for a postdoc and then faculty position. So I was just wondering um, if you could talk about maybe how the kind of transition into postdoc versus transition to faculty, if there's sort of different advice you have for that, or different experiences. Or... Um, OK, so uh, there's a couple things. This isn't a question that you asked, but it's a question I feel necessary to answer first. That if you're looking at a postdoc, the postdoc that you're looking at should be in line with what you plan to do down the line. So if you, for example, want to end up at a research intensive place, do not take a postdoc where you're teaching four or five classes per semester. That is not going to put you in line to work uh, so that's that's what I want to say. Postdocs are fantastic if you pick one that fits with what you want to end up doing or what you think you want to end up doing, because that the time that you spend during your postdoc is what's going to get you in line for your next job. So I just want to say that really quickly that postdocs are great if they're something if they're a good fit for you, basically. Um, 
The second thing is that I refer to my postdoc as assistant professor light or diet assistant professor because I was still doing a lot of the same things that tenure track faculty were doing. I was teaching doctoral and graduate courses. Um, I, like I said, I was mentoring doctoral students. I was conducting firsthand research. I was publishing. So I was doing all the things they were doing. I just didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily held accountable for it in the same ways that, that faculty were. So. I was still on the faculty, you know, I couldn't, couldn't go out drinking with the grad students and share secrets and things, you know, I was, I was still in a faculty role, um, but I was closer to their age, in fact, some of them were older than I was, and so, you know, it, I think in one way that was a source of tension, where they're sort of like, oh, well, but don't you want to hang out with us, and like, can't we be besties, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm on your committee, like, I can't do, you know, and so I think the role ambiguity was probably the hardest part in terms of transitioning from a doctoral student to a postdoc, whereas the role ambiguity might still exist as an assistant professor, but it's much more clear what your role is. Postdocs, at least in my field, are fairly new. I was the inaugural postdoc where I was, so nobody even knew how to deal with postdocs. Um, they just didn't know. And so depending on your field, it might be kind of a new thing. So I would say that the transition is maybe a little less, it's a little murkier, um, you know, when you're moving through those. And also I would say that, um, uh, like I said, your responsibilities will be different, but as long as you can maximize what you're doing in your postdoc, that's going to set you up very well for your, your first faculty position. So in terms of, like you were saying, research in the pipeline, um, I walked in the door two months ago, and I have a book under contract, and the full manuscript is with the publisher. Like, so ODU's name will be on that, and it will be great for my tenure case, but I didn't write that here. I wrote that somewhere, you know, or I wrote a lot of it somewhere else, you know what I mean? So... Um, um, yeah, if you, if you can maximize those opportunities, then that's, that's good. Um, did I answer your question? Okay, all right. Did, it, did anybody else have any other? Um, yeah, I do know if any of you had to interface with maybe a professor that you had while a student, and now the relationship has changed since you've become faculty. I want to know how do you deal with that transition in terms of someone seeing you as a subordinate and now your colleagues, maybe in some other sphere. How do you deal with that transition? I, I, at least with my advisor, you're the progeny mm -hmm. of your advisor, and I think they take great delight in your success. And so, uh, although I don't actually collaborate and do research or publish with my advisor, there is a little bit of a uh, uh, child or, you know, progeny kind of relationship, an offspring relationship. Um, but if you were at the same institutions teaching, that does create, I've heard that takes a lot of mm -hmm. tension because mm -hmm. it's very difficult to transition. One piece of advice my advisor gave when I applied to is I was still a grad student when I applied to ODU. She said, when you go to apply to ODU, you're a faculty member, you've been a faculty member for three years. Walk around like that's true, mm -hmm. because don't pretend you're a grad student and see another grad yeah. student, because there is a little bit of an identity shift that yeah. takes place um, that you have to begin to take in on the role of, uh, of, of a faculty. So you're, if you, I've heard of you stay at the same place, it's quite difficult actually to have the faculty, um, to have that social role change very easily. Right. And I think you demonstrate it, because that was sort of what I was speaking about at the beginning. There's a transition from going to a peer from the student's perspective to stepping into faculty, and then from the faculty's perspective, they were um, teaching and mentoring you, and now you are one of them. Mm -hmm. So you really just work hard and demonstrate your competence, and that goes a mm -hmm. long way, too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And one of the people that I worked with when I um, was at my postdoc was someone who was on my committee as a doctoral student. And so that's how she sort of knew my work, and we were talking about things we wanted to do. And um, But in that person's case, they have sort of a, um, a, a non-hierarchical mentoring style. And so for me, I guess I've the transition for me has been fairly smooth, because as I became a more advanced graduate student, I was working as a colleague with people who had been on my committee. Like, we co-authored papers and... I was the first author on some, they were the first author, you know, and, and so I think it really depends on whatever the relationship is, or if you have a very hierarchical or, or progeny sort of uh, ment mentor, um, that might make your transition a little bit, it might take a little bit longer <laughs> um, to do that, but I think definitely, you know. I, yeah, my, my mentor was non-hierarchical as well, mm -hmm. and I co-authored as well, but mm -hmm. I mean, I, progeny is, I, I just had dinner with her uh, up in D.C., she works at the NSF, and um, I mean, the idea is that 
Um, I mean, th there's a legacy. They, they want, I mean, right. especially, yeah. this is a very, very successful scholar, mm -hmm. and they want to see other successful scholars out there who are really leading in the field. And there's really no greater delight, I think, that they take than they feel like there's really going to be some high quality scholarship going on as a result of my investment, the co publications, mm -hmm. the co, mm -hmm. the mentoring, all the advising sessions, the tears, the, mm -hmm. the writing, the rewriting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a kind of a, a nice, there's a unique bond, maybe. It's a better way than to maybe make it a hierarchical type relationship. Oh, yeah. And, and also, to be fair, like this person who I'm talking about who was non-hierarchical and then I worked with, people also saw me as sort of her protege, so they actually called me Baby Jody. So, like, it was actually, people interpreted it as a that sort of relationship, but um, it wasn't necessarily. And so, um, I guess I just mean that um, if you act like their colleague and you put forth the required effort and, you know, if you take the initiative, you write them and say, hey, do you want to co-author on this? Do you want to work on this together? Um, you know, I think as long as the channels go both ways, that's how you can maintain that that peer relationship. But I think also sometimes you do need to call them and say, I'm really having a moment here. <laughs> like, I need help. And they will also fill in that advisor mentor role for you, even once you've grown to be their colleague but I will say it's very it's very cool when you become when you feel like you become a colleague of your mentors it's it's great so it might take a while but when it happens it feels very satisfying uh, I think just yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that I mean uh, going back to what she said like <coughs> like in my case uh, my advisor is like a very big shot in the field so everyone kind of looks up to him what happened so so recently i published a paper and then he came personally to me in a conference and said oh that's good work so i, I think the mm -hmm. if right. you you need to build that uh, respect for yourself by your work i think that's what uh, elevates uh, you to their i wouldn't say to their level at least to a peer level i guess that's the only mm. thing. yeah and, and also one of the things i had problem with was uh, when you work in a group, obviously all your peers and students and everyone says, oh, you are junior, Jody, or mm, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it can help and also it can be bad. Yeah. <laughs> it puts a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of expectations. So right. I think it's important not to take them too seriously. <laughs> yeah. but, but you should take advantage of the network opportunities when yeah. they present themselves. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I say also build relationships with faculty outside of your department yeah, and your school and your college. So that will also help because that will be in a more a more immediate peer to peer relationship. Mm -hmm. I think Abraham has a question and then there are some questions from our WebEx. Oh, cool. Students. Oh, that's cool. Um, I just wanted to ask it, you kind of touched on it um, throughout the whole panel, but in, in building your research network, that would be faculty member for um, doing just the networking from a national perspective. Like, could you give some practical tips? Like, because I know a couple of you talk about, well, we go to conferences and we show up to events, but like, what, what's the practical, like, in your sense? I have I have a tip. Um, so if you go to uh, like if you go to the conferences and you go to a panel that they're presenting on, or in my field, there's something called author meets critic, where people who've written books can uh, face the audience basically. And uh, if you've read the book, go and ask a good question, ask a really meaty theoretical or critical question, and then at the end you introduce yourself. And if you can, like I said, maximize these opportunities, you can say, "I'm so and so student. I know you've worked together in the past." Um, Here's my card. Can we talk about something, something, something? Or tell your mentor ahead of time. I'd like to make a connection with this person. Can you help introduce us? Can you grease the wheels? Can you mention me? You know, and I know that sounds very social climby, but in a, I, I'm from a very small, you know, criminology and criminal justice comparatively is a very small field. And so everyone knows each other. And so utilizing your informal networks is really sometimes the best way to go. So I would say utilize your informal networks, but also go there, show up, look good, be impressive, talk to them, engage them in a conversation. Hey, do you want to get a coffee? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Um, I think a lot of us want to talk about our work. Uh, <laughs> I love talking about my research. So I would say yes to you any day to go talk about it or email about it or that sort of thing. And I would agree. I would say network. I actually was able to access a secondary, national secondary database from one of my colleagues having a connection to Excellent. that and being willing yeah. to facilitate that mm -hmm. communication. So I think that that was a very big help to get in the door where I might not have been able to do that without the gravitas of her work behind right. me. Right. So I was very appreciative for that. Right. So um, one of the questions from from the audience was that we kind of talk a lot about struggles with the research side, but what about uh, struggles with teaching? So, for example, for preparing lectures, how do you choose resources? How do you pick the textbook? Um, how do you manage time in the, uh, across the topics of 
across the semester. So if any of you want to kind of speak to some of the teaching struggles and maybe some tips and suggestions for doing it better, avoiding some of the pitfalls that, mm -hmm. that you find yourselves in. I mean, uh, for me at least, uh, the first time I taught was in ODU. So it was my, I taught in my first semester, I taught one class as an undergraduate class. Uh, I, I only gave a couple of presentations before that in a, in my in one of the courses taught by my advisor. But so one of the things uh, that I felt was uh, uh, I, I expect too much because I, I'm I'm kind of excited with a lot of ideas. Then I, I uh, and I expect the same level of intensity from students as well. Uh, instead of gradually building up that excitement uh, or the level of difficulty, if I may say. Uh, I, I used to pose, pro I mean, until if it's, it's good if you challenge the students, but the uh, level of challenge should not be more than what they can handle. Uh, it's important to get that right, and I, I think I didn't get that right in my first semester. Mm. Uh, I, and we had, uh, in, in, in at least in civil engineering, we have a uh, teaching workshop organized by American Society of Civil Engineers. So I, I, I had the opportunity to go there. So any teaching, uh, training programs, things like those, they definitely help. Now, uh, small changes, not these are not like big structural changes that I made in my teaching style, but these are small things, uh, study objectives. Every class, I say, these are the three things that you're expected to learn at the end of the class. So small things like this uh, will make a big difference in how, you, you can actually feel that uh, they're different. Students, how they respond to you before and after. You, you can compare easily and you can find the difference. So I think, uh, if any opportunity, if you get as a student, while a student, uh, but formal structured training program, uh, that, that will be very helpful. And I'd say the Center for Learning and Teaching is a humongous resource here, mm -hmm. especially for your first year of teaching. And sometimes with the first classes, um, those classes will have already been taught or they're in the curriculum and there's a basic syllabus or outline. That's where you have to really invest a lot of time and be several steps ahead of the students. The next year, you can spend a little bit more time fine-tuning fine things and making it your own. But I think we've talked a lot about being flexible as well. The very first semester I taught, I ended up teaching five courses because one of the faculty member had a very severe illness and was not able to do her course load. So things had to be split up and we had to shift gears very quickly. And um, you just do the best you can. But the very first time you teach a course, it's not likely going to be one you've developed from scratch. So you have a little bit of a foundation, and then you decide if it's the best text you're going to use the next year. So sometimes just maximize the resources you have the first time around. There's some wonderful resources on uh, Stanford Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, looking backwards course design. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer that a well-designed course makes, uh, it saves you a ton of time. Yes. Uh, it takes a little bit of extra time to do it, but it saves you a ton of time when you do it because it runs itself eventually. Um, and uh, with that too, when you design that syllabus, getting feedback from faculty, not about the yeah. content, not about whether or not you're covering the right authors, but practical, practical mm -hmm. kinds of issues. Do I have the right policies in place? Do I have too many assignments? Is the pacing of the semester what you've seen work for these students uh, as well? And, um, and, so, and then the last is uh, asking, midpoint feed, uh, yeah. asking for feedback for students at the midpoint where it's anonymous, they write it down. You, it's almost like getting feedback from peer reviewers. They're going to say lots of different things. It's going to contradict. It's easy to d dismiss some of the comments, but if you just kind of sit back and look at the gestalt of what they're trying to tell you, you'll learn a lot about your teaching directly from your students. Uh, not from any one student's comment or any one student's suggestion, but kind of making it a, a, a dialogue or anything in conversation. Right, and I think also, um... You know, one of the one part of the question was how do you pick the textbook? Some some of the courses I teach, actually most of the courses I teach, there's not really a great textbook. I mean, uh, there's not a lot of people teaching these courses throughout the country, and so sometimes you make your own. You know, you say, okay, well, I like this article, I like this book chapter, I like this documentary, I like these current events, I like this writing assignment, and so there it is. I've taught four courses that I've designed, and I don't use textbooks. Now, I'm sure that textbooks would save you time in some ways. But you know, if you really want to um, tailor your, your students' learning experience to your objectives and to the course material, if there's not anything out there that fits the bill, then you, it's OK. And I think in some ways, it's actually less work, because these might be materials that you're super familiar with, where you know what the argument is, you know what the details are. And so for me, 
some classes I don't have to read it because I've already read it five times. You know, I, 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 just, I know what my notes are. I know what I'm talking about. And so um, I would say those are just minor, th you know, uh, you would think a textbook is a minor thing, but it's kind of not. I mean, it's the course material that students are learning from. And so I think it's okay to have a, a course that you fabricated yourself that, that you came up with. Um, this, I mean, your first semester might be really tough because because you'll be working on that over the summer, really, before it starts. But, you know, if that's better for you than reading a textbook and having to learn it from this perspective, then it might it might be preferable. Um, but also in terms of the um, the practical thing in terms of uh, s student problems, for example, if you are having an issue with a student, you need to talk to somebody in your department or you need to reach out if you don't know how to handle it. There are issues with FERPA, you know, where a student's parent will call you and say, I want to talk about this. And you're like, whoa, I need I need to find out if you're even approved to, to you know, I can't have this conversation with you. Or, you know, students disclose certain things in their writing where they are think of harming themselves or they've experienced sexual assault in the past. And you have to deal with that as the instructor. And so reach out if you have a problem. Um, with your, your faculty. And also most departments have something like a teaching committee review or like basically the teaching component for your tenure packet. There's a committee that will review that. And so before I came in the door, they said to me, do you want to send us your syllabi? And we'll look and see, like you said, is the, is the workload appropriate? Is it up to our standards, basically? They didn't police what I assigned. They just told me this is consistent with other upper level electives that are being taught in our department. Go forth and prosper. And so now I'm already ahead of the game because I knew it was in line with what they wanted. And now there won't be any surprises when I get that review because they've already reviewed them prior to me teaching the courses. So anything you can front load to reduce stress later, that's my suggestion. Okay, and another question is, can you touch on the period between accepting the position and starting the position? Specifically, how do you best prepare and what was the experience like I think no. in order to best prepare, you have to know what the expectations yep. are for that role that you're going to be playing. So understand the expectations and then start to work on the things to help you be ready to teach that first day that you're in class. You can't wait until the first day and then start yep. that course preparation. Yeah. Okay. And, yes. And use the resources that are available, maybe to somebody who's taught that course before or done other mm -hmm. things. Um, so understand the expectations clearly. I think the same thing, uh, understanding the expectations and like, for instance, I knew that the first year I would take some time settling down, so I made sure that I have some publications which are already under mm -hmm. review process which will get published by the time of end of the first year, so I kind of planned it that way. Uh, and also I knew that I had to teach a class, so the time between my job and starting here, that I, I used to always allocate some time to prepare the notes and mm -hmm. And assignments, things like this. So, I would say everything from the very first phone interview you have to the campus visit. Remember, you're not interviewing for the position; you're building a relationship with your colleagues eventually. Mm -hmm. And so, if you approach that interview not as trying to necessarily show you're qualified, but to realize, do I want to be with these people? That's right. Do I really see myself That's being right. successful with these people? Mm -hmm. And and do I mean do am I going to be the kind of person that they're going to want to be with? Mm -hmm. They're going to they're going to have to give me feedback about my research and teaching. Uh, and so the idea of thinking about the interview process is building that relationship um, mm -hmm. and beginning that process and realizing that um, your, your fit in your department is just determines so much happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if it's a bad fit, you're gonna eventually have to do it again. So the transition um, you know, involves, um, you know, I think sometimes you socializing with people mm -hmm. like you mentioned, um, but building the relationship, whatever you could, even in the negotiation process. Yeah. I mean, you can really turn a dean off Mm -hmm. And a department chair off when you basically ask for a salary that they can't meet. Yep. And everybody's in a hard situation. Yep. And if you're demanding certain things, and, it, and it, these are real, my, my faculty mentor studies uh, early career faculty, so she tells me a number of these stories, and it really starts off in a sour note rather than yep. kind of thinking of building this relationship uh, as opposed to negotiating salary or negotiating for the position, mm -hmm. um, which, which is what you're doing, but you're also, there's a bigger picture to all these interactions that you're taking place. When they're going out, by the way, they're, when they're taking you to lunch, mm -hmm. they're wondering those questions too. Right. Am I going to enjoy working right. with this person? Mm -hmm. um, you know. Yeah, oh totally. The, the interview, I mean, obviously you're trying to, to get the offer, well, if you like the place, I guess you're trying to get the <laughs> offer, but, um, 
but they also want to sell you on the place too. So you're, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Because once once they make that offer, whoop, now it's you who needs to, to figure out if this is where you want to be and that sort of thing. Um, but I think definitely one of the suggestions you gave was it absolutely was true in my case where I wanted certain things. I wanted to ask for certain things. And my chair said, I don't think that necessarily is going to work, but here's something that could work. Or this is the number I think you should offer because you know, this might turn them off, but this is something they could actually meet. It might still be difficult, but they might still meet this, you know, so I think definitely being strategic about your allies and, you know, how you can do that. But something very, very uh, logistical and basic is that once you accept the job, go back to the place where you accepted the job and, like, find housing and hang out with people and go to restaurants, like, do, do something there. Um, my partner and I, once I accepted the job, we couldn't get here for something like six or eight weeks. And we were almost like counting down the days. Like, we can't wait. We can't wait to go to Norfolk. We can't wait to find a house or, you know, an apartment. We can't wait to do this. And so it was this really exciting thing that we could look forward to. And my department was gracious enough to actually help me fund that trip here to be able to find housing um, because they knew that was important for somebody moving hundreds of miles to a new place, bringing a partner, you know, um, that that was important. And so if you can, you know, if your department says, we'll give you 500 or $1,000 to come out, take it and go there and be excited. And that can help your transition. And so then once we found the place here, we're like, oh yeah, we're good. Like we just need to worry about our, you know, our transition here. Our place is set, you know, our lease will start on this day. Like we're good. So if you can at all do that, go back to the place, get your, you know, get your apartment or your house or whatever. Um, just get, get that part out of the way. And then you can be excited. We can say, oh, wow, you know, look at all the cool stuff that's here and let's try this restaurant. Let's try this. And it was so much fun. And we ended up staying an extra day and driving back overnight so that I could uh, make my class the next day, basically, <laughs> like, because uh, we were so excited. But anyway, that's my suggestion. If you can go back, check it out again. And I, that was post-decision, if I didn't clarify that. That was after you made the decision, but, but it's part of your transitional period. Um, so one question is, what if we don't want to, what if we want to teach but have little interest in research? How do you get ahead in academia or are we sunk? So no. I can, You're, yeah, no, I can speak all. a little bit because there are non-tenure and tenure tracks. And in right. many of the non-tenure tracks in many of the colleges, research is not the primary expectation. Yep. It's certainly encouraged, but it's not the primary role. So if you have more excitement about teaching, maybe consider a non-tenure position. Mm -hmm. Or start out as an adjunct and really be involved mm -hmm. in teaching and then maybe have another um, civilian part of the career, gaining some experience in that, and then make the decision if you really want to go to teaching. So adjuncting is a very nice way to really transition and focus on the teaching first or non-tenure track. Although do the research on what adjunct get, gets paid uh, yeah. because it's quite low. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I would say there are also a lot of tenure track positions that are at teaching institutions. So um, a lot of, uh, usually you might see the term SLAC. Uh, some people say small liberal arts colleges or selective liberal arts colleges. So places that um, uh, are really teaching focused where there's a lot, there's small classes, you know, there's only 12 or 15 students in each course. And some of these are the best universities in the country, right? But you're still teaching four or five courses per semester. But it's a great job if you want to teach and you want to be engaged with, uh, you know, engaged intellectually with undergraduate students. So there are tenure, um, non-tenure track jobs, but also tenure track jobs. And I would say for the folks who want to go into teaching positions, that is what's going to matter when you go up for review. Like if you have, there, there are stories of people who have incredible research productivity, but they're at teaching, or it's teaching schools and they don't get tenure because they haven't met the expectations of their university. So if you want to teach, that's awesome. There's a ton of great places out there that have, um, you know, that focus on your teaching and your service. And you just need to, um, you just need to find that, you know, the, the ads are out there. You just need to do some research about what the teaching load is. But there's a ton. So no, I want to say numerous times, you are not sunk at all. You're just in line for a great uh, teaching oriented position. I saw a tenure portfolio today was a binder this thick from somebody from Tennessee State University. All teaching, all, all service, mm -hmm. no research. Yeah. And this person's a strong candidate for yeah. getting promoted. So yeah. like, there are places, yeah, plenty absolutely. of places. In fact, the majority of places. The majority, yeah. Most of us are educated at research universities. Yeah. <laughs> Because they, they tend to have doctoral programs. With they, really intense faculty. I mean, yeah. like, you know, really high-achieving faculty. Yeah. Your faculty would not be your faculty if there weren't incredibly high-achieving. Um, 
And so. Totally. Do I have any questions from the audience? Okay, so I have one last more strategic kind of question from um, our WebEx participants. So this is this is a, a little bit of a, of a longer question. Given that student debt is the largest sector of debt in the U.S. and the rising cost of tuition, many economists are predicting an education bust in the same style as a housing bust. So as faculty members employed in this sector, how do you think future faculty members should position themselves to survive this possibility? Hmm. <laughs> um, from, a higher, I mean, from a higher ed standpoint, the fact is we have about 60 to 75% of faculty are adjunct faculty. They're all contingent faculty. So the way universities are going to deal with this is they're going to fire all the adjunct faculty. Okay. If you're a tenure track faculty, you're you're pretty well protected. So you really don't have anything to worry about. But you have a lot to worry about if you want if you thought you had a faculty life, but that life is slowly, slowly kind of ebbing away. And so that's why it's um, uh, you know I think you and the other thing we're going to see is um, programs will be shut down. Institutions that are not at the top of their field or don't have some kind of distinguished mark. They're just going to close. We're seeing universities close. We're seeing mm -hmm. uh, institutions. Yep. I would like put ODU at a we're a research institution, but we're a, we're not in the top fifty universities of research. We're having to come up with differentiated programs. If you have a very generic program and there's all the already start strong programs, those programs are going to die slowly yeah. and have to be kind of folded in. And you don't want to be in a situation where you get reassigned because you thought you wanted to do this program, but it's at a, it's at a struggling institution. So there's going to be a lot of. Um, there's going to be a lot of change, I think, with um, the way um, higher ed is structured. Right. And I would also say be willing to explore flipped classroom teaching, online teaching, that everything mm -hmm. might not continue in the same format that it yeah. is under brick and mortar for all academic things. So there will be many opportunities to sort of change the way the um, learning occurs. Yeah, definitely. So okay. A shutting down of one area will open up an opportunity for another way of conveying information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of universities are instituting online programs in order to um, deal with this. And um, also, I would say, though, that um, uh, the concern about <laughs> faculty stability or, or that sort of thing, um, if you're, and maybe this is naive, but if you're doing good work and uh, a lot of folks have really good success on the market, they get jobs that are good fits for them. I mean, search committees tend to be pretty good about figuring out who's going to do well at their institution and who's going to do well in their field. And so if you're doing the best work that you can in whatever way that is, um, often, and, and you're well connected, often that's going to work out for you because you're going to be worth it to the university to keep or to hire or to tenure. They're not going to want to let you go. Um, um, but also I would say, yeah, that, that the educational, a lot of programs are seeing additional um, enrollments, um, maybe not law schools, but <laughs> a lot of programs are seeing additional enrollments as students are seeking college degrees. So, um, but it is true, some, school, some departments or schools are consolidating or shutting down, and so um, I think, especially in some particular fields, there, that's more of a pressing concern than others. Uh, foreign languages, humanities, tend to, to get hit hardest. And so I think you need to be really strategic about your opportunities and positioning yourself as unique and moving your field forward and how you benefit a university. All right, last question. I was going to say, can we end on a better note? <laughs> well, if not, I would like to, on behalf of the PFS Steering Committee and uh, members of our audience, I would like to thank our panel our panelists, thank you so much for your insights Thanks and for having us. Your answering the questions and sharing your perspectives. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming. your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for those comments.